So welcome to the Golden Age podcast. We firmly believe that in spite of all the chaos and confusion in this world, deep in our hearts we're all dreaming the same dream of a beautiful and blossoming world that's going to unfold once the heart of humanity awakens and we remember who we truly are. We also believe that this time is much closer than we think. And here at the Golden Age podcast, we interview inspiring guests that through their creative work, their presence and dedication are contributing to the building of a new world. And I'm very happy to have today with me my friend and colleague Kyle Brooks, who is an experienced meditation teacher. And I know you just finished teaching a silent meditation retreat in Mexico, where you're living. And uh, I want to open our conversation with the simple question. Uh, Kyle, please tell us a little bit more about what actually is meditation what is, and what are the benefits that it brings. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, and it's beautiful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, okay, what is meditation and what are the benefits that it brings to people? In a nutshell, I guess meditation is like a flow state, like entering into a flow state. Um, you know, like with an artist creating a piece of art, they can just go and create for hours without even, you know, remembering the time or thinking about going to the bathroom or whatever. It's like everything just folds into one activity and there's a flow, a natural kind of unfolding of that activity. Meditation is kind of like this, but it's in this sense, the way I'm teaching meditation, the way I was taught and the way I was kind of trained to teach meditation. It's a flow state, but the activity is non-activity. It's just resting in ourselves. It's just feeling and falling in love with our own presence um, and letting the mind kind of <clears throat> not become silent. I wouldn't say meditation is about silencing the mind, but letting the mind become relaxed, more gentle, more spacious. Um, our thoughts are not the center stage activity, although they may very well be there on the periphery. And instead, there's just this flow of intimacy, a flow of uh, deep, deep resting. Beautiful. Um, Would you say meditation is <clears throat> a way to switch from the mind and doing back into just being in presence? Sorry, would I say that meditation is about this? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I would definitely say meditation is an invitation to learn how to let go of constantly kind of like going up and out, basically letting the attention and the energy come up into the thinking mind, into the eyes, into the doing, into the getting. Um, not that that's wrong, not that there's anything wrong or bad about that, but just noticing that we do that a lot. And the more we kind of go towards things, the future activities, making money and so on, um, the more of a tendency there can be to kind of forget, to become distracted from just being who we are from just letting our, letting our life flow. Um, and so meditation is a reminder. Like we can still do this. We can still have projects and things, but meditation is a reminder not to forget the essence, not to forget just presence, simplicity, and let, you know, ideally there would come a time where what we do can flow from that presence rather than, you know, maybe I would say, Resting in that presence is a, in itself a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of completion. And ideally, resting there, we can allow what we do to come forth as an expression of that fulfillment, rather than forgetting about the fulfillment that's inherent in us, and then grasping at things, trying to find fulfillment in projects. So it's like our, our projects can be trying to get something, or they can be an expression of that which we already have. You said um, fulfillment that's inherent in us. So would you uh -huh. say that meditation is basically like a key to reconnect and to find the happiness inside? Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say it's the only key, but I would say what's learned in meditation is the foundation of any key. You know, it could be dancing, it could be painting, it could be singing. You know, there are lots of different ways that people come back to themselves, right? But what we learn in meditation is Maybe it's the simplest, perhaps, maybe I can say it's the simplest approach to just coming back and finding that simplicity and peace. And that can be translated, like I said, into ice skating or, I don't know, making hats. 
but <laughs> beautiful um <clears throat> And yes. I know how powerful it is to meditate together with other people. Actually, even us, we also meditated many times together in, in the past. Mm -hmm. and I know that in a meditation retreat, it's basically a group of people meditating together over a longer period of time. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that looks like? What's the setting like? And also, what are the benefits? Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so the retreats I teach are 10 days. Um, typically, sometimes less, sometimes maybe more, but typically 10 days. Um, complete silence, no technology, no books, no talking, no, no passing notes to each other, with the one exception of people can write questions to me or whoever else. Normally, I lead with a friend or a, um, a teaching partner. So people can write us questions, and we answer them in the evening. Um, but otherwise, the format of the retreat is... Um, people sitting in a hall together, meditating many hours a day. <laughs> so I know that meditating together with other people can be very supportive and very powerful. Even us were meditating together in the past and I always found this very enriching. Now, I know that you just completed teaching a silent meditation retreat, which I know is basically a group of people meditating together for a longer period of time. And I'm curious, mm -hmm the retreats that you teach tell us a little bit about what's the setting like how can we imagine such a silent meditation retreat to look like and what's happening there okay yeah so the retreats i teach are typically 10 days could be more could be less but typically 10 days um <clears throat> and the idea is to come kind of as as close as possible to being kind of in solitude um of course we're not close to in solitude, we're with a group of people, usually in an enclosed center. So, you know, everybody stays within the perimeters of the, the center grounds for the entire time. Um, we're in complete silence. So there's absolutely no talking except for, I usually teach with a partner, with a, a teaching partner or a good friend. So there's absolute silence except for the two of us sharing uh, teachings and instructions. Um, and then there's no internet, no music, no books, no TV, phone, anything like that, except for having a journal. It's the only <laughs> route to sanity sometimes, but it's um, yeah, it's the only kind of activity that people engage in besides sitting in meditation, uh, receiving teachings through um, discourses during the day, and a little bit of hatha yoga that is included in the in the method in the style that we teach. Beautiful. Um, I have a question. What would you say in the end of the 10 days, what's the benefit that people take with them? Because it sounds quite hard, so people... I wonder, like, why does, why does someone do such a meditation retreat? <laughs> That's interesting. Many people don't seem to know why they come. Um, either there's a sense of like, oh, I'm looking for something, but I don't know what, and this is my kind of like, it was recently the last retreat that you mentioned that I just came out of. It was a guy that had been traveling nine months in a van um, around the Americas. <clears throat> um, and he said, like, he left Canada looking for something and he couldn't find it anywhere that he went. So he thought, you know, maybe I'll try a retreat. And he thought it was going to be like, a... <laughs> funnily, he thought it was going to be sitting around a campfire, smoking a bit of weed and singing songs together <laughs> for 10 days. It's what he actually thought he was coming to. <laughs> the day before he came, somebody told him like, uh, no, like you're going to be sitting in a room meditating in silence many hours a day for 10 days. And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> but he came anyway. Um, and it's a beautiful example, actually, because in a way he came like not knowing, but which is also amazing because there were no expectations, you know? He expected a campfire and he got something completely different. So he didn't know what he was getting himself into. And he did struggle. But at a certain point, he let himself start crying for the first time, he said, in many years. And then he cried a lot, like every day, every session he was crying. And then even in the sharing at the end, he was just, you know, like we have a final sharing on the last evening where people kind of like, they get their voices back and they get to share a bit of their experience. And he just couldn't stop crying the whole way through. Um, and he said, like, he'd never been, he'd never known himself as too sensitive of a person or crying too often. Um, and it's a beautiful example of 
what people get from these retreats. So the basic invitation to put it, to boil it into a nutshell, I mean, there's quite a lot contained in the retreat as far as teachings, but the basic practice, the basic essence of the teaching is let yourself come back to yourself. Like we spoke about, stop going out just for a moment, you know, don't stop forever. You don't need to stop forever, but just for a moment, pause or, or let it lessen and just kind of come back, come back to yourself and feel yourself. And for many people, like for this guy, it's the first time maybe that they've been given permission to just feel like, oh, this is how I feel right now. Like, this is what it feels like being me. You know, even at the kind of like personality level at the, and like, let's not talk about for now, non-duality and the dis dissolution of the personality structures and so on. Let's keep it simple. Like even at the level of being a human person and, and our basic psychological makeup, the invitation just to come back and feel what it feels like right now in my experience, what sensations are in my body, what agitation is in my mind, what emotions do I actually cycle through on a daily basis? Many people have never been invited to do that and even told that it's lazy or inappropriate or too sensitive or some hippie thing to do, like to just feel yourself. Um, so would you, so say, one of the, would you say meditation is a way to deeply feeling ourselves more fully? Mm -hmm. I would say this is the, I would say, honestly, this is where meditation has to start. Yes. Um, you know, you can give someone an, an annoying instruction, like stop your mind. And obviously if there's agitation in the body and you're uncomfortable and you've never even noticed that you're angry 45% of the day, you're not going to be just like, oh yeah, stop the mind. I'm in peace. Mm -hmm. It starts with feeling like who you are now at the relative level, how you experience life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and just noticing, you know, like noticing, how does it feel in my body? Where am I carrying tension? Um, yeah, just getting more intimate with the experience of being here. I would say that's a, a foundational kind of like, a foundation of meditation, a foundation of a healthy psychological life, a foundation of a um, thriving spiritual life, a foundation of healing on many, many levels. Um, I mean, specifically here, we're talking about psychological healing and just yes. feeling more comfortable with who we are and our life experience until now. And I think it all starts with just like the simple invitation to come back to feeling like what it's like being here. And yeah. I know that you and me both share the vision of a very different world <laughs> than the ones we experience in the media, at least. And that we share this dream of an awakened humanity, an awakened planet. And what would you say, what role plays meditation in the awakening process of humanity? And also in this new society that we want to co-create together as humanity. If there's going to be a new, like a birthing of a new paradigm in this world, then it's not going to be through abstract philosophy or, you know, it's, it's not it's not going to be for the most part a change that happens from the outside at the level of like superstructures and you know, the way we organize things it's going to be a change that's going to at least at least in equal measure let's say have to take place within if not more so um, take place from within and it would be in my vision a shift towards or what i would love to see and what i kind of feel like this what i want to offer and what i constantly am trying to work on in myself through these retreats and through my practice is like this movement towards empowerment and autonomy and a deeper sense of like love and acceptance of just who I am and how my life is and how the world appears. Um, you know, the sense of like taking full responsibility for everything that happens in life. Um, And I feel like that would be the foundation of uh, a movement towards a, a new way of being in this world. So to make that a bit more tangible rather than just an abstract idea. So to make that a little bit more tangible, a little bit more you know, direct example of what I mean, um, 
we can go around, you know, I can go around projecting my unprocessed, unfinished um, emotional experiences onto other people. I can expect them to behave a certain way. I can want things to be a certain way. And I can perpetuate blaming and being stuck and feeling the victim of my life and you know, holding other people responsible. And, well, we don't need to talk more about that, but we know the kind of... Um, we know the kind of mind state that that entails and the way of relating to other people, the way of, um, the way of operating in the world that comes with that kind of, that kind of vision. Or I can kind of start to take full responsibility. I can start to make what's in my subconscious mind conscious. Um, it's this beautiful quote from Carl Jung. Like, um, until you make, I think he said, until you make the unconscious conscious, um, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. Forgive me if I slightly misquote, <laughs> but um, this basic idea, like if we can bring that to the surface, if we can take full responsibility for it, full ownership of it, um, we stop being the slave of it. Uh, we stop holding other people responsible for how we feel. And there's autonomy, there's independence, there's the capacity to love, to forgive, to, to really show up and be present without taking everything personally. I often have the impression that many of the problems that we experience on a global level are also due to the illusion of separation. It seems like there's always another, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, the terrorists. And how would you say meditation can help us as humanity to remember that we are actually one family, one humanity on this planet? Hmm. <clears throat> Oh, this is actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it's something I talk about in the retreats often. Like if we generalize a little bit and say most of us take ourselves as very separate bubbles, uh, like you're saying, this illusion of separation that we believe in quite firmly. I mean, even to call it an illusion of separation is a quite odd and bizarre thing for many people. Right? We see how we relate to each other, how we treat other religions, races, and so on. Um, taking that sense of separation as the basis of how we relate to each other and to the world. It's like if I'm a separate bubble, everything outside, and I believe that this is all I am, everything outside me is other. Everything outside me is um, unknown. And the unknown is scary. And so in a way, it almost makes sense if, if we take that to be true, the separate bubble perspective, then it makes sense to be afraid of everything else that's outside. Only it's not coherent. Like if we look at the, how that echoes in our world and how that leads us to relate to each other and to ourselves, it's not coherent with what I think, maybe this is again, a bit of a generalization, but what I think all beings really feel deeply within themselves that you know, love is a deeper value than fear and who's right and who's wrong i think all of us know that and i think all of us deep down we believe that and we want that it's just a slightly confused or misguided way of seeking that imagine how it would be you know if if we came back to ourselves we came back to this sense of intimacy we let ourselves open to that deeply felt value that's maybe vulnerable and maybe scary and maybe you know a little bit um <clears throat> A little bit difficult to touch into sometimes but imagine if we touched into that sense of intimacy and we looked into the eyes of someone that was different like, uh, you know different culture different color different language and instead of focusing on the surface level you know, if we know ourselves on the surface level of ideas what we meet is the surface level of ideas in someone else and then those things are scary but what if we knew ourselves in a deeper intimacy We knew ourselves in that deeper value of love and interconnectivity. And then we looked into the eyes of someone that was different. And instead of, you know, we embrace and we acknowledge the beauty of the culture and all the things that we don't know about with a curiosity, but we see deeper, we feel that intimacy. We meet on the level of that shared, shared value of love, shared value of like basic human goodness. How different would our world be? You know? mm. Could we stand on the other side of a line and shoot each other if we you know, <laughs> knew each other at that level of like, wow, 
these human beings know the same suffering. They know the same beauty. They know the same aliveness that inspires them to be devoted to their God, even if they call him by a different or her by a different name. But they know the same aliveness and the same like basic, like well-wishing for humanity. I think our world would be a very different place where we could really honor and value all of these differences in culture and, and beliefs and, and perspectives and thrive from the sharedness and the, the possibility of learning and growth that comes from all of that variation. Um, yes. And meditation is you know, not, again, not the only, but maybe one of the most important, one of the most direct, one of the most simple ways of just recognizing that. So yes, I would say, you know, it's the foundation of building a, a new world or a new or inviting a new paradigm in this world. Yes, it's like a me medicine for humanity. <laughs> One of many <laughs> medicines for humanity. Yes. Beautiful. And I know that you're fully dedicated to your path. And you've probably done hundreds and hundreds of days of silent meditation in your life. You also support people as a moderator in my palm leaf and uh, write very inspiring articles also about spiritual topics. Um, Please tell us a little bit, what inspired you to really dedicate yourself to this path of exploring spirituality and exploring the inner wonders of life, the mysteries of life? Hmm. Well, to be really honest, in the beginning, it was suffering and a rejection of the way I was living, um, you know, facing a lot of struggle and not wanting to face that struggle but not knowing that the way through it was to show up and face it actually. Um, and so in the beginning, it was kind of an escape. And I think it's that way for many people, actually. Um, it's something I notice in re also teaching retreats. And, you know, I've taught a lot and over the last 10 years. Um, and I think it's something quite common that the idea of enlightenment or realization or spiritual growth for many people is actually just a cute way or a, you know, a, a socially acceptable way of saying, I don't like who I am and I wish I would be someone different. And so it's this kind of like rejection of things as they are, which interestingly is the stepping stone into spirituality for so many people and a completely contradictory uh, understanding to the actual message of spirituality or any spiritual journey. Anyway, so for me, it was like this. Um, and, you know, after some time, I started to feel like actually there's something here. There's something genuinely here um, that makes sense, that resonates as like <clears throat> more relevant in my life than anything I was doing before. So it, it took a while, but I started to feel this sense of like, You know, like in the, in the looking for something, occasionally you glimpse something, you know, in the trying to escape what it is that you are running away from, what you don't like, what you're unable to accept. Occasionally you taste something and those tastes um, give two things, it seems. One, an experience that, there's, that there is a possibility of safety, freedom, thriving, uh, understanding, wisdom, grace, like, That those things exist. They're not just ideas that some guy wrote about in a book. And secondly, they highlight the incoherence between that kind of vision or taste of something beautiful and the, <clears throat> and the way that we are, the, the, the thing that we're running away from. And with time, it's like, okay, if I really value this other vision, I have to integrate. I have to understand how to embrace that something that I've been running away from, the, the mess of my life that I tried to escape from. Um, and as I started to kind of, you know, realize like, wait a second, I can't just run away from that to get to this. That comes when this is completely held and completely loved and completely dissolved in just this beauty. Um, it really started to catch fire. And I was like, wow, this isn't, this isn't just um, a hobby. This isn't just something that, you know, an escape or a safe place. This is everything. This is like really 
the only thing that actually makes sense, the only thing that actually seems to bring any possibility of fulfillment or, um, or completion or satisfaction in my life. Um, I started to feel like actually there's no way of living the life I even imagine I would like to live, you know, without that fulfillment as the basis. And it kind of uh, became and is becoming still more and more just the central thing of like, okay, I could do these projects, but if they don't come from that completion, then what's the point? What am I offering to people? You know, like even to like think about teaching and so on, like sharing retreats, and like, if I'm not coming from that place of fulfillment in myself when I'm offering these things, then what am I offering people? If I'm still grasping and looking for something else and looking for a better future in a project and a plan, then really all I'm offering people is that. All I'm sharing, because all I can share is myself, all I'm sharing with people is where I'm at, which is looking for something else. And so, yeah, it feels like an incoherent way of living. And the more this reflection comes, the more it's just like, huh, oh, the only thing that makes sense really when it boils down to it is letting everything in life come from that trust and that sense of like, there's a fullness and completion here. And that is what I want to offer. That's what I want to let blossom. I know you're living in a very uh, creative town in uh, Mexico called San Cristobal. And if someone feels a call to come to Mexico and do a silent meditation retreat, maybe with you or another teacher, how can they find find out more about their meditation retreats? So yes, I'm living in San Cristobal de las Casas in Mexico. And I teach mostly here with a very, very dear friend. Um, her name is Sasha. And I would actually maybe suggest that you invite her to be a guest on, on this podcast at some point. Um, but a very beautiful and inspiring human being. And she has a retreat center here. Uh, it's called Hridaya Family. It's a, kind of a branch of the main Hridaya school. Um, and we offer these 10 day silent meditation retreats in the Hridaya style. And we also offer retreats um, that are a bit more of a blend of a non-dual vision in Tantra with elements of psychotherapy, um, working with the shadow, the inner child, also working with breath work and somatic meditation practices, movement practices, um, to help with this kind of like, when you realize that you don't want to be just chasing after that and it's time to start integrating that, that's kind of exactly the point that we're hoping to meet people and be able to facilitate a kind of like a, a harmony um, in that integration process. So still keeping that um, vision of non-duality that we we're both so touched by through Sahajananda and through Hridaya Yoga. Um, yeah, but... Beautiful. I know bringing Sahaja this video but integrating the personality right? a little more. Sorry. Sorry? I know Sahajananda is one of your meditation teachers. Right? Just to clarify the audience. Yeah, yeah Sahajananda was my first teacher and I still consider kind of like my... Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think of him as like a spiritual father. <laughs> Beautiful. But, um, yeah. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Kyle, for holding the light of consciousness through your practice of meditation and thank you for sharing that very precious medicine for humanity also in the meditation retreats that you're teaching it was a pleasure to have you here today mm -hmm. and i look very forward to meditate with you again in the future yeah thank you so much also for the work that you do with these podcasts with my palm leaf and the, the deeper vision of serving humanity in this way It's touching and it's actually been a, a beautiful support for me recently in the times we've worked together when things have been a bit more difficult. So yeah, I really appreciate the vision that you hold and uh, what you are showing up for with the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. Look forward to meditating with you again soon. Yes. Thank you. Bless time. Thank you. Thank you.